Welcome to the February chapter meeting of CSI Next. Um, this is the first meeting of this new year, and my name is Nina Gilio. I'm the CSI Next chapter president elect, and I want to welcome all of you for attending. Glad you're here. Hopefully, I think we're in for a real exciting program today, and looking forward to it. Before we do begin that presentation. I'd like to open up a brief intro with a few items, kind of announce our next meetings. Next month is going to be March, and our meeting will be by our chapter sponsor of Bayer Paints, and they will be presenting Why the Fuss Over Volume Solids. I believe that presentation will be by Jonathan Meany of Bear Paints. So we're looking forward to that and certainly would like to see everybody attend because Bear does sponsor our chapter. In April, we have Vivian Voltz presenting Flex the Specs. And again, I think Vivian's presentations are always insightful and we look forward to having her join us as well. Registration, as usual, will be opened and available shortly, and so keep an eye out or visit csinext.org to make cert certain that you get signed up for those meetings. If you're not a CSI Next chapter member, we would really like to have you join us as well. And we do have monthly email blasts that go out on occasion in addition to the meeting notifications and any chapter events or other information. Today we are really, really pleased to have Daniel Hargraves join us and present Digital Art. This is not BIM. If you have any questions, please feel free to type those in and he will answer them along the way or I'll break in and make sure that he's focusing on those as well and assist to make sure that we're having a good dialogue. At the end of the presentation, there will be a survey. If you'd like to receive learning units, please fill that survey out. And if you have an AIA number, please include that uh, so that you can receive your AIA credit. So with that being said, I will like to introduce Daniel today. Many of you are familiar with him, but it is Daniel Hargraves, FCSI, CDT, AIA, RAS. He is an architect and project man manager for SRA Architects. Daniel serves also as the operation manager for that firm and is considered an expert by his peers and the architectural community. Daniel has been in the architecture community for over 30 years and joined SRA in 2013 where he is responsible for establishing CAD and BIM standards, CAD and BIM training, and has served as lead mod modeler on several major projects. Daniel's very familiar to us because he has served and has been an integral part of the CSI Next chapter for many years. He's currently serving as electronics chair and treasurer. In the past, he served as the past president for the Dallas chapter, which probably means at one point in time he was also the president. Obviously, he was the CSI Next president and has been heavily involved in the South Central region as an intro, as an institute director. So welcome Daniel, thank you for your presentation today and you now please proceed. <laughs> Thanks Nina. Now if I could keep the presentation shorter than my bio intro, we'll be doing real good this morning. <laughs> I do want to uh, welcome everyone to uh, CSI Next. It's uh, a little different being on this side of the microphone, um, but let's go ahead and jump into this. And the reason, uh, the first time I gave this presentation, it was just simply digital art. And at that presentation, someone was all excited because uh, they wanted to know how to render using BIM and everything. And so that's why I ended up with the little tag, this is not BIM. And with that, let's jump in. Uh, as mentioned before, the CSI Next is a registered provider with the AIA, and this is uh, an accredited for CES. So please, at the end of the webinar, fill out the survey. Uh, if you just need a certificate, that's fine. Include your AI number if you need it to be registered with them. These materials are copyrighted, and all the other legal stuff is now out of the way. 
our learning objectives, as you saw in the uh, eBLAST, is really to distinguish <clears throat> the difference between BIM and 3D rendering presentations, understanding computer software for creating 3D models versus 2D graphics, setting up an architectural scene using computer lighting and materials, and finally, comparing technical difference between interior and exterior renderings. So the first thing I wanted to touch on why this is not BIM. BIM is much more than just the, the three-dimensional representation of the model. Uh, Kind of, if you look at the screen there, you'll see, you know, there's a floor plan, a wall section, the 3D model. The 3D model is one of the tools for producing renderings, for looking at the different spaces during calculations. But BIM does so much more than just producing that rendering, giving you that pretty picture. You get the construction documents, you get data uh, from door schedules, uh, intelligence there, and as we go into the renderings, as you're going to see, uh, my renderings have no intelligence to them, uh, let alone the artist, but we won't go down that path. That's why this is not BIM. And I have some quotes that I always like to read along the way. Art is the desire of a man to express himself, to record the reaction of his personality to the world he lives in, by Amy Lowell. And really, that's what we're focusing on here is art. One of the keys with rendering is be happy, don't hurry. The rendering process is a slow process. One of my favorite commercials from Staples, if you can find a Staples store, maybe they're still online, is that big easy button. And I remember when I first started doing this, working with AutoCAD, 3D Studio, and other programs, it's like, well, can't you just hit a button and make the rendering happen? It's like, well, no, it's a little bit more than that, and it's a it's a timed process. Um, but a man's work is nothing but this slow trek to rediscover through the detours of art those two or three great simple images whose presence his heart first opened, and that's really the approach that I take even to you know rendering a building to rendering something surreal as you see here this turtle on the screen, getting the idea, setting it up in the scene, and then rendering it is, uh, it is a, it's a slow track and it's a rediscovery every time. So let's jump into the tools. Every artist dips his brush into his own soul and paints his own nature into his pictures. One of the things with the tools in art and rendering is it's just that, from the paintbrush to the pencil to the ink pen to, you know, even your graffiti artist, those spray cans, it's just a tool because it's the idea that is really being conveyed on the canvas. And as you know, this goes back thousands of years to the original cave paintings, pigment on stone. We zoom fast forward 1,000 years and it's still... In one form of another, it's been pigment on something. And there are some exceptions to that, and we'll touch briefly just before we jump into it. But, you know, from the painting of the Mona Lisa using pens and pencils, even photography is getting the image through the camera lens, a pigment onto the camera film. And then you see the guy on the telephone pole, and you're thinking, well, that's nothing to do with art. That's our moving forward into technology. As we had the industrial revolution and the spaghetti of the internet and technology and the invasiveness. Which leads us to Gene Simmons never had a personal computer when he was a kid. So I really encourage you with children to get a computer. And if you're even in days of retirement, without that computer, you can slip back into those. So let's talk real quick. Both of these images that you see on the screen, the blue sphere and the white sphere, are computer graphics. They were both created with the computer. The difference is 2D and 3D. 2D 
Think of it as painting, photography. You're working on a flat surface. You're using, in the case of this, I used a sphere on a white background with another light gray sphere kind of at an angle to give the illusion of a shadow. That's the blue side. That's the painting. You can use programs like, uh, you know, photo paint, um, Corel Draw, all kinds of those for creating those 2D images. On the other hand, working with 3D tools, that's like sculpting. And I mentioned earlier that, you know, for the most part, a lot of art is 2D, but you do have the exception of, you know, just some really wonderful sculpting and such different tools and mediums from bronze to marble to wood. And all those are, you're starting with a mass of something and whittling it away or a combination of different shapes and masses. You've probably seen like steel welded together uh, out of old car parts where it ends up looking like an antelope or something like that. That's kind of the approach that the computer takes with the building blocks. Every computer object, even in a BIM model, uh, AutoCAD, 3D Studio, you have what's known as the primitives. One form or another, it's based either on these very simple primitives you see here, the cube, sphere, wedge, cone, pyramid, cylinder, and torus. And there was uh, the very first 3D model in a computer was a teapot. And in a tribute to that, if there's any 3D Studio or 3D Max users out there, there is a primitive that's a teapot. And that's where that comes from, that little bit of history. Um, but once again, it was, you know, that was a primitive. It was the whole object in its own form. But you can take any of these. You could take a sphere and subtract it from a, a cube. And you have these void volumes. And you can use any of these in combination, subtraction, length, height, so forth and so on. So in a typical uh, building model, most of it is made up of cubes, even though it may only be, if it's a wall, four inches thick, 10 feet high, you need a door in it, you take a cube and you subtract another cube, and that gives you your basic elements starting to get a little bit more complicated. Uh, and so, before I jump in and really do a model, I first want to come up with the concept. No great artist ever sees things as they really are. If he did, he would cease to be an artist. And that's kind of the approach that I take. The, the real world renderings that I do are different than my surreal work. Um, I add artistic flair to my renderings, but at the same time, when I'm working in the surreal, Something is inspiring me, and it was the days from when I used to do ink on paper, uh, which was always one of my favorite medias to work with. And so the very first thing that I'll do is when I get an idea, I'll sit down on whatever, you know, coaster, napkin, scrap paper, meeting agenda. Uh, my meeting agendas are... Uh, don't, don't lose my attention too long because you'll probably find a small sketch somewhere on it. But here, um, I have a sketch of, I, I want to have a guy pushing a large ball up a hill. And so I do the quick sketch and then I start breaking it down. Okay, what do I need from a modeling standpoint? Well, I need an entire mannequin. I need a plane for the sphere to sit on. And then I need the sphere itself. The nice thing about the sphere is it's one of the primitives, so I don't have to create it. Any program, it's a matter of clicking, I choose sphere, and it's done. So you look at the complexity of this mannequin here, and uh, you can see in the different views, being three-dimensional, I can see them in any uh, format. I can, uh, I can get them to sit down, he says series of different primitives from you can see spheres and tor or not torus cylinders, um, 
you, you can see that he's really made up of nothing more than those primitives we saw before. The shapes are exaggerated. Uh, in the case of this one, this is a cone with it taken off at the bottom, a sphere put on the top, and so that creates his head. The neck, another sphere, the shoulder joints, those are spheres, but elongated and arms or toruses, and so forth and so on. Feet are spheres, once again, elongated, uh, subtract it out. So you really have to break down the different model components. Then you start putting them together. And one of the keys when building a model, when you know, you're using it for digital art, and I've used this mannequin on several different pieces after I built them, is you give yourself easy control points to make them flexible because you can see where he's on the blue, very static, stand up as if you just bought this little wooden art mannequin at the store, and then same thing, real easy to fold his arms, make him sit, make him push, so forth and so on. The plane is, this is an interesting concept, how this works in most 3D programs. Instead of, there's also another primitive that's called the mesh in sorts. And all I had to do here was give it a line, and that's the the magenta line that you're seeing on the edge. I tell it, okay, I want it to be so long, and then you can even see over here in this little corner uh, the a potential location for a camera. So then in the software, I put all the pieces together. I create the sphere, put it on the plane, bring in my mannequin, set him there, and you can see down here in the bottom, and this particular model image, I, I worked up in AutoCAD, but you can see those primitives sitting down there right at the bottom, and then you have addition, subtraction, and the other one is difference where you could, and that's the mannequin used all of these tools to, to create them. So now that I have the model set up, that's one of the the other nice thing about being three-dimensional a sculpt, sculpture, I can take any view and uh, look at it from any angle. So you can see the camera in that first view is looking straight at the sphere, mannequins off to the side. You can see there's the image of the camera sitting there. But in reality, you know, I can be up above in the lower left corner. I can look at this from any angle, any view. And that's one of the nice things about working with a three-dimensional model in the computer is unlike working with 2D art is if I want to change the view, I just have to redraw everything. Once I have the model created, I can move that camera around. And a camera is, is just another tool inside of the software that lets you um, position it very easily. In some of the early days when I started uh, this uh, 3D rendering, uh, there were no cameras. So you had to mathematically know where you want to stand and where you want to look at. So over time, they they have made things quite a bit easier. So you can see here with the different camera views, I can look at it straight on. I can come over from the left corner. I can really get the view that I want. And then once I have the view, I save it, I lock it, and then begins the next process. So I have everything modeled, I have my camera where I want it, but if I were to actually render it, the scene is gonna be black. So you need lighting to send light into darkness of men's hearts, such as the duty of the artist. And without light, you don't have darkness, and of course without darkness, you can't use light. So it's really, takes both of those. And it, the computer recognizes that you have to have lighting for it to uh, illuminate. There's several different light sources in the computer. And over time, they've created these uh, different sources. This first one here, it's the sun. And you position it just like uh, this is existing somewhere in the real world. Uh, programs have even gotten more sophisticated where you know, I could tell it that I want to look at this model from my location 
And in the case here, you know, I want it to be, you know, February 10th, 2016, Tucson, Arizona. And there would be choices to do that, and it would even do all those calculations. Or you can manually uh, control the sun. So I picked the summer, about 3 o'clock. And uh, one of the things that the sun does in a computer model, just like the real sun, you get sharp shadows. The reason being is, the sun is 96 million miles away, so your light source doesn't fuzz out quickly. The alternative is using artificial light, and the computer uh, gives you choices from what they call spotlight, point light. So point light is like an incandescent light bulb. It's kind of floating there in the middle. Spotlight comes from a single source, like a can light. And you can see when you have a close light source, you have a bright spot and you have the, the shading on the edge. And you can even see in the case of the uh, sphere and the mannequin, the same thing is happening here where you have the darkness of the shadow, but the shadow uh, falls off pretty quick. And then you get out to the edge of where the lighting is and then it starts falling off once again until you get to the dark gray of the, the background. Another technique out there is what's called HDRI. And what this does is this is a uh, high definition uh, artificial light source. So there's cameras out there that people have taken photos from you know, almost every location, every condition. And you can see in the image on the right side that it, it's like it's a sphere, and you could, if you could actually connect all those edges together uh, where they start and finish, it would be uh, very similar to like a panoramic view. But you can see in this particular image, there is a, a hot spot for the sun. It's a clear day, so it's a very white sky, but there is some shadowing coming in because of the trees and so forth. So when you take this image, the software then calculates, okay, I've got one hot source, I've got all this light bouncing around. So you get, unlike the first one where I just use the sun and it gives me a sharp shadow, HDRI actually emulates real world lighting conditions. And you can see you've got ambient light where light is bouncing off the bottom of the sphere, softening it up, you get uh, soft shadows from the mannequin. He doesn't, because he's so thin, he's not creating any hard shadows down on the ground plane. So it has a very natural, realistic feel when using one of these HDRI files. And these are all available on the internet and a lot of the softwares out there do understand them and work with them. So it's a nice way if you're doing exterior renderings to uh, get a softer, more realistic view without resorting to the, the harsher sun angles. So once your model's lit, if you've noticed here, so far our sphere is gray, our background is gray, our mannequin is gray, you need materials. So you have a model, you have it lit, and now comes the last third of putting everything together, and that's the materials. And from these, the short collection here, uh, these are kind of the basic six. You have a single color, which is the purple on the end. Metal, and the metal can be anything from chrome to brass to stainless steel, uh, polished, satin, uh, any kind of metal. There's usually enough settings where you can emulate it. Glass, and kind of says it all, some transparent material of some sort. Plastic, which kind of has a different, uh, if you've ever looked at, plastic, it always has a little bit of a sheen to it, but it doesn't really reflect what's going on in the real world. Clear is like the paint on your car. It's a clear coat. You have a pigment under it and then a clear coat. So when it's, you know, waxed and polished, nice and shiny, you get lots of reflection. And then the last one in this particular list is textures. Uh, one of the tricks that um, there, there's repositories out there on the internet now, but one of the tricks I used to do would be photographing a large wall of, say, brick or concrete or even wood 
And then you would open that up in a photo paint software and get it to where the lines don't match and it just looks like a seamless ending of a texture. Because one of the things, textures may make the rendering go fast, but it also makes the model very large, the larger the texture is. So you're always trying to find that balance of saving your computer resources for the actual rendering itself. So in the case here, uh, using this modeling uh, software, uh, creating a, a ceramic material gives me a sample of a sphere and I'm going to make its highlight white. I'm going to not do any textures, but I'm just going to add some intensity and sharpness. That way it really reflects the color. But on the ground plane, I want the lines to show up, so I just use a texture map. And the same thing with the mannequin, I use a large wood texture map, and then it'll wrap around the mannequin to where the seams don't meet up. So then the rendering process, I've applied all my materials, I've got my ground plane, I've got my mannequin, I've got my sphere, I hit the render button, I go get my cup of coffee and come back later in the day and I have a rendering. Depending on your software and uh, really sets the, the time, the softwares keep getting faster as do the computers. And then as the computers get faster, the software realize or the software companies, they have the, it's like, well, we can make it this much more realistic and so forth and so on. So it's always about this. The more realistic something gets, the longer it takes. In the case of this simple little rendering, it was probably only took it about 40 minutes. And this uses what's called a pass method of rendering. So it starts off looking very grainy and it keeps sharpening it, subdividing it, improving on the shadows, improving on the lighting. And each software does different methods of how it creates it. So that kind of gives an overview of the uh, rendering process. And then I kind of wanted to touch base on uh, some items that I've created. And Nina, I don't know if there were any questions. There, um, actually, I have one, and that is when you were talking about the textures and um, colors and multiple things, does it take longer if you have multiple selections? So, you know, if you have 15 different textures and 20 bazillion different colors, does that make a difference to the time in rendering, or is it pretty much straight no matter what? No, it does have a really good question. It does have an impact. Not so much you could have um you could have three hundred materials in there. Okay. What slows down the rendering, and this is almost true with any rendering software, is two things will make it slower and slower. First one is lighting. The more light sources you have, so if you're doing an interior rendering of an office suite, and let's say it's you know a call center, so you have a big open floor, you have 400 you know fluorescent lights that you want to show in this rendering. Well, it's got to calculate the source of every light, every material that it's hitting, and then the bounce back to the camera, and then plus the interaction of that object's lighting source and its bounce back. The other thing that um, will slow it down is anything with reflectance because it's not only having to calculate its own material, but it's calculating the materials of the object next to it. And you can see here, like between the sphere and the cube in this with the chrome, the sphere, it's not only having to calculate, okay, this is a, you know, a chrome reflective material, but I've got a, the object next to me plus and you can almost see in this first one, you can see kind of the glass object right there. Um, so that's even making it more complicated because it's got to reflect the glass object. The glass object is reflecting and there's limits that you can set up in software and that's called bouncing. So a lot of times you look at 
you know, how far do I want to take this bouncing before I want the computer to quit guessing and calculating how far to take it. But between reflective materials and transparent materials, those are the two that slow it down. Object, objects that render quickly are anything that's of a flat color because it's only calculating its own. And then anything typically with texture, unless you give it once again reflectivity. Does that kind of answer it? Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. Okay. Well, if there's no other questions, I kind of jump into uh, some past work then. An artist is someone who produces things that people don't need to have, but that he, for some reason, thinks it would be a good idea to give them. And uh, two Christmases ago, I decided to break out my pen and paper, and uh, I actually did art for the entire family. And it, it was kind of interesting because I, I hadn't picked up traditional, what I call traditional media in probably 20 years. So that was kind of fun to do. And it is, in reality, uh, you do stuff not so much for yourself, but for others. This is kind of a, uh, want to kind of touch base on some of these and you'll see the progression. So this model here, uh, before the days of BIM was probably turn of the century. And I mean that from, you know, the 1990s to 2000, uh, this was all done in AutoCAD, used a uh, rendering software, AccuRender. And so you modeled it, I could spin anywhere. And uh, you get a good level of detail and so forth, but the computers were limited in how far I could take it. And you can see there's, you know, almost no background, very limited on the foreground. This goes back to that question of things taking a long time. This was one of those renderings uh, that I think from when I started it to see the results each time was about two and a half days. And then as software progressed, kind of the same thing, uh, you, you get better lighting. This one here used the HDRI lighting, so it's real soft and subtle. Same program, though, AutoCAD and AccuRender, but just about uh, six, seven years later. And I'll do a lot of these studies, surreal things. Uh, and you can do architectural, you can do close-up interiors. Once again, uh, this was exploring ceramic, glass, chrome, uh, textured patterns, and the two woods are actually just two different uh, textures, so you kind of get the, the light and the dark there. Um, once again, this is using a this white that you see behind it is what's called a glow texture, so it's getting most of its lighting from that source you can see there's a little hot spot in the ceramic bowl. So I was starting to experiment with uh, the HDRI. This is an early rendering from Revit. Um, this was my last office, and as we were kind of seeing how much light is coming into the space, we were really curious, you know, do we need blinds? Uh, and so this kind of answered the question that, yeah, we're going to get a strong wash of light and so we ended up you know we were hoping not to have any blinds on the windows but the orientation didn't allow for that but it also gave us a sense of you know are we making our half height walls too high too low so forth and so on um, exterior rendering also done in Revit and this was done about a year ago um, and they've improved their rendering engine uh, materials and so forth uh, Rendering this on my particular machine took about an hour and a half, but one of the things that Autodesk has started doing is uh, offering rendering in the cloud. So I say, render this, and you buy these predetermined amount of credits, and then three minutes later, they say your rendering's done. And so it's really nice in... Uh, you don't want to tie up your machine for a long time. Use the you know the large render farms out there in the cloud and uh, lets you do those types of things. Uh, this is inside the space. Lots of texture mapping here from the the columns to uh, the log wood, glass looking outside, 
And one of the nice things is you can tell it whether it's an interior or exterior rendering. It's using, in the case of a BIM model, uh, you know, I had to tell the electrical engineer, yeah, I want, you know, lights up in this dome up here. And so when I go to render, I assign my materials. Um, it knows that, okay, I'm going to render inside the building, so go ahead and wash out. And if you've ever taken a picture when you have the sun outside, this is in reality what you, you get. You get that washed out look to get the inside space to be uh, lit correctly. Another exterior rendering. And then once again, developing the detail. And that's one of the keys when you start modeling is there's a lot of things that I don't need to convey construction documents. But when I start rendering, you know, plants, rocks, uh, you know, in, in my drawings, I just have a simple light fixture symbol, but I need more detail. Same thing with the main entrance door. I don't have to get to the level of detail, the jam style, so forth. Uh, clay tile roof, I have no need in a three-dimensional model, and that's a very complex roof to have. But when I go and do a rendering, I, I want that level of detail uh, as opposed to, you know, having a photograph of a you know, a clay tile roof, it looks flat, adds what I call uh, one of the levels of, it gives it a, gives it a way that it's not a real image. And a lot of times I'm trying to uh, sell what the final product's going to look like. Have I made the right design decisions? It adds a level of comfort for the owner. Um, and it looks good in marketing brochures too. Interior lighting, same thing. Lots of detail that I don't necessarily need for construction documents. But one of the beauties of working with, you know, uh, a BIM software and then doing the real world renderings is you can really start to see where I'm having problems with, you know, constructability. Um, is my space comfortable, you know, to in the case of a dining room, have I made my volumes too high or my room too wide where I feel like I'm in a cafeteria, not in a dining room anymore? And even when we recently moved our new office, this is uh, this software here uh, is it's in an experimental stage right now, and I think it goes in for sale uh, within the next month or two. Um, but this is uh, Revit and V-Ray, which once again, you can see the your lighting keeps getting uh, more realistic. And then to enter the surreal, uh, surprisingly, this model here, I did completely in AutoCAD. So there's no limits. Things don't have to be square. They don't have to be flat. Uh, you can work with any shape if you can think of it. This was, I mentioned earlier, um, before the days of the camera, this entire scene was created mathematically. So I had to work out on paper. I, I didn't have a modeler. I couldn't look at the sphere. I couldn't look at the plane. I couldn't look at the naked tree. Um, I, I had to work it out all mathematically. and. Uh, this particular one I did back in the mid nineties. Um, and when I would start a rendering, it would take nine days before I would finally get to see the final product. And if you made a mistake, it's like, well, I think I can live with it. And there is a mistake in this one. And I love pointing it out. I mistextured this marble here. It's green. It's not clear, but I mean, that's not a mistake. That's uh, intentional. <laughs> This was same same program, POV, persistence of vision, uh, no modelers. You, you did everything mathematically. Uh, working with Rhino and Flamingo, and you can see the programs all have a very similar look to them. Uh, this was more of a lighting study. Uh, one of my early attempts of working with HDRI, and for some reason, I just wanted to model a pig. Um, a light test and material test. Uh, the material of the candle is water. So it was one of those uh, trying to create a flame and fire is very difficult in rendering. 
3 d studio uh, working with depth of field uh, and this is uh, the air doesn't have to be clear in this case water you know you can only see so far and then uh, program here Bryce uh, just very different light putting the light in front of the uh, camera to put everything else in dark shadow just trying to create a mood um, another another rendering done with Bryce uh, this isn't a photograph even though it looks like one of the lakes here in Arizona um, this is Terrigen and once again I, I do studies and I, I play with things and then I usually end up moving on working with cameras don't have to have the entire world in focus this is I, I wanted just very near to this first sphere to be in focus and then it keeps getting out of focus and that's how our eye usually works too so it helps add a, re a realism to it and then just working with some primitive shapes um, this is my global tv global sphere global warming and then studying materials lighting uh, almost as if a void space so where's the blue coming from where's all the other colors coming from so it's just once again something surreal and kind of zipping through this was a uh, triptych where the three pieces would hang on the wall you got the ship coming into Easter Island and then of course the little pun of Easter Island with the bunny rabbits and then of course can't let my mannequin and his three-man band get away without playing at Easter Island. And then once you come to the end of all your renderings, lighting, materials, hopefully you find some balance. Boy, I need to update that last slide, don't I? <laughs> Any questions? Anyone else? That was really, really interesting, Daniel. And coming from somebody that doesn't do any of this, but hears some of these terms being used, it was really, really helpful for me. Um, I don't see that we have any questions. Do we have any dialogue that we'd like to have? We've got a few minutes that we can uh, spend visiting about this. Cindy asked if I could show some of my past Christmas cards. Uh, are we doing time-wise? It'll probably take me a minute to find them. We are actually fine for time if you have a few minutes to be able to look for those. Yeah, give me a second. Uh, actually, I know exactly where to get them. Turn off the screen for a minute and right. I think I have them all available online except for the last one I did. What Cindy's talking about um, is I, I, for MPI architects, uh, I used to, every year I would do a Christmas card. And we're gonna actually start from the beginning. Let's turn that back on. Okay. So what started these, David Marcy, he was another one of the principals. He used to do, he did these for three years by hand. And he started off elves doing construction. And you can see 05, 06, 07. And usually one year going out, one year coming in. And then um, I, I did kind of as a joke one year, um, uh, I was showing them uh, this new software, and I did this little car hitting a snowman and his head popping off and rolling, and he said, you need to do that as the Christmas card. So it became kind of a tradition. And 
uh, I was kind of rushed. And if you notice, he got a elf, and it ended up being elves versus snowmen was the theme over time. Um, but you kind of see the evolution of these things. Uh, if you notice, these elves have no feet. Same one with driving the car. I ran out of time. I couldn't draw the feet. And then, of course, you know, given it another year, had more time to do it. So in 09, the snowman that was carrying the eight, well, taking it out. He, he you know, as the elves are bringing in the 09, they cut through them. And then the same thing, elves bowling. And of course, you know, this was for 2010 and uh, a strike is a 10. So that was kind of the inspiration there. And then in 11, they're hauling off the 10. And I always used whatever the last one. And of course, snowmen, they, they're always trying to take revenge on the elves and the elves are just doing their work. And in this case, one snowman got in the way of the other, firing the cannon, and of course fell short anyway, blowing over the other snowman. 2012, we actually moved our office, so we kind of had a uh, you know office moving. Of course, the snowman made the move too, but it wasn't good for them because, as you can see, m more of a melty man kind of thing. And then they used the 11 to sail up to the little island. Let's see if I had a so. Yeah, on this website, I don't have the 2013, and uh, which was uh, we did as an open house, and then 2014 never got published, so I don't have those two online. But kind of once again, kind of doing the whole theme of things and building on each one, so I would have more elves to work with, more snowmen to work with each time. And that's all I have. Great. Cindy, thanks for asking for him to, to share those. I had not seen them. Um, those are great. So, any last questions? Well, hearing nothing or seeing nothing, um, again, please make sure that you do fill out the survey at the end if you want the credits. And we will look forward to visiting with you next month in March. Again, our sponsor, Bear, will be presenting Why the Fuss Over Volume Solids. Look forward to seeing all of you then. And thank you again, Daniel. I appreciate it. It was a great presentation. Thanks. I enjoyed doing it. Y'all have a good week.